So, um, uh, we are in like month five of Climate Week now, that's what it feels like. We are all completely sort of institutionalised to running backwards and forwards across Manhattan and having big conversations about climate change. So, um, this session is one which I've been really looking forward to, which is talking with some amazing uh, media representatives, some journalists, some storytellers about covering the solutions. Now, I've worked in the solutions business as co-founder and chief solutionist of Futera for almost 21 years. And I have been to meeting after meeting and conference after conference of sustainability people bemoaning the fact that they can't get their stories into the media. As if the purpose of the media is to essentially be the PR industry of climate change solutions, which of course we would all love it if you were, but that of course isn't the purpose of the media. So what we're here today to talk about is not why the media should cover solutions, but how the solutions industry, how those of us who are coming up with these answers can make our stories more media worthy. So what is it that makes a great story? Um, and what makes a terrible one? So I'm so excited to, uh, to welcome, and I'm gonna make sure that I get everybody's job titles right, to welcome uh, Justin Warland, Senior Correspondent at Time, uh, uh, Eric Croston, Sustainability Editor at Bloomberg, and Zoya Tierstein, uh, Staff Reporter at Grist, all of whom I read regularly. So I am a little starstruck to have, um, to have such amazing uh, uh, journalists on this panel with us. And thank you, because I know that usually you're the ones asking the questions, so it, it is quite fun to be able to ask you some questions. So uh, let's get started right away into the bad. And now the motto of Solutions House is answers only, um, but let's just like put that aside for, for brief. Tell me, if you will, like an example of like the worst pitch, the worst press release that you've had of someone trying to sell you a solution story. We want to really hear it. Hit, hit us with it about what we're getting really badly wrong. And feel free to name names or like keep it anonymous if you want. And then maybe maybe somebody in the in the audience might cringe in terms of it was theirs. Um, uh, so uh, Justin, I'm going to come to you first. Sure. Well, thanks uh, for having this panel and hopefully we can provide something insightful. Um, I, I think the thing that comes to mind that drives me crazy are press releases from people who, um, well, don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, and I think the, the, the thing that comes to mind to me is oftentimes, and it's oftentimes it's not the people who are actually doing the work, it's you know, some sort of third party that's been contracted and you'll get an email that's uh, you know, very clearly you know, not really steeped in, in this. And so the one that comes to mind is somebody who first line in their email uh, was explaining to me what the Paris Agreement is and then explaining it incorrectly. And uh, I've been and, waiting for years for somebody <laughs> to tell me what the Paris Agreement well, is. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think uh, there are lots of things about what it can do and might do and is doing, but there are actually facts. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you get the actual facts wrong, that's an immediate trash. Uh, so that's my example. I love that. So someone telling a correspondent who's an expert in this, uh, what the Paris Agreement is, uh, I want to know what they got wrong, like the date, the stats, the, did they call it the Berlin Agreement? No, to be honest, <laughs> I don't really remember it was such a, it was such a quick, I a remember quick being event. struck by it, but I don't remember, it, you know, it was probably, you know, a year ago or more. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. Eric, have you, can you have a story that tops that in terms of terrible press release examples? There's, there's press releases that you screenshot the title of, and um, if, if it's bad enough and you tweet it out. <laughs> but I always, I do feel bad doing that. So, but if it's really bad, you screenshot it and you send it to your colleagues. Um, I think it's sort of more seriously, like it's hard to think of a single one, but there's like a structural issue at hand, which is the difference between really at the core, like what journalism is and what PR is. And like, I get paid to go through as many sources as possible in the time allotted and put together a story with new facts that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And PR uh, press releases are, you know, uh, by definition, you know, are tied to a specific client usually. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so there's just like before you even open an inbox, you know, there's this disconnect between like a story, like clearly a, lo a long story could have like 20 or 30 sources. Um, like a small story, you know, could have like half a dozen sources. And so um, like before you, before you even open an email, like pitching one thing, it's just not what you know, we do. And so, and like, I think there's, I'm my, probably an outlier in some ways in my, like, a lot of my work is very macro. Um, but then, like, maybe the last thing is just, like, somehow, like, the, like, uh, fashion and, like, jewelry um, people got all of our email addresses. And so, like, I get all this email about, like, sustainable jewelry. And I'm just like, I write about geology. You know, I guess gold, well, comes, gold comes from somewhere, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so what's, what's your favorite worst one that you've clipped and sent around? Um, I did send this one around because I kept getting emails from uh, this, like, animal rights group that had uh, saved, like, mm, like, 500 chickens from a slaughterhouse and sent me just an uh, unending number of emails about it. It was like nonstop. And the, the first few, I was like, that's so sweet that they saved all those chickens. I'm so happy that that happened. I'm not going to write about it. I'm a climate journalist, but um, that's great. And then by email 12, I was like, this has to end. Like, when's the end of the chickens? I, they're saved. That's it. There's nothing else to say. A press release about a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> that's like basically what it felt like. Yeah, I think that and like any, uh, any press release, and this is sort of casting a wide net where it's like this this one solution, this one thing will save the planet. I think that you know, anyone who really understands the extent of the climate crisis understands that there's one climate solution, which is stop burning fossil fuels. We've known that since the 1970s. So um, anything that pretends otherwise um, doesn't really begin to cover the extent of the issue. So when I get these claims, I'm like, it's an immediate X out, because I'm like, there's, you know, it's like the solutions I like to cover are usually um, smaller scale, community level, um, not talking to some CEO of a tech company about what their tech that's very new and not scalable yet is going to do to save the planet. That doesn't usually work for me. So you were talking now about the kind of uh, solutions you do like to cover. Mm -hmm. So what for you, and you can give an example or just give me an outline of what makes a really great story. We heard about the, the number of sources that it needs, like there needs to be an angle, like you know, what, what, what is just like the dream solution story on climate change for a journalist? That's to me. Yeah, uh, but it will also be to these two, but I'm, I'm gonna go backwards and forwards. I think it's, I think it's beat dependent. So, um, you know, like everyone, for example, my colleague Emily Pontecorvo writes about carbon capture and storage a lot. She writes about hydrogen. I mean, those are solution stories to some extent. She writes about it with a very like keen eye. Um, not everything is a solution, but she writes about it. Um, when it is a solution, she writes about it well, but to me, that's not, I, I, that doesn't really get me going. I'm yeah. not super excited by, you know, hydrogen or, um, I'm, I'm more excited by public health stories, by communities sort of banding together to um, help each other out of a tough situation. I was in Alaska reporting a story about that a few years ago where one community in Kodiak, which is a very small city um, in Alaska, they had this threat where there was this toxic shellfish issue just washing up on their shores. and people were, were getting really sick, some of them were dying, and the community sort of banded together to help each other out. It was the tribes and local researchers and the local university that were all working together to do this, and I thought that was a really cool story, so I flew out to cover it, um, and that's the kind of thing that gets me really excited about solutions. Brilliant, thank you. All right, for you, what, what is the, what's the formula for a great story on solutions? If there were a formula, I wouldn't have to work so hard, um, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, the very first story I did on this topic was about, I don't know, people may know the name Sally Bingham, uh, who's um, uh, a reverend in San Francisco and had her own congregation. And many years ago, she decided she wanted to buy solar panels and get um, solar panels on the roof of the synagogue because it was like, you know, uh, conducive to scripture. And I was just like, <laughs> like utilities and scripture just had not like entered my mind before. And like from that story, I was pretty hooked on the notion that like these energy and climate stories that are really cool are about totally counterintuitive partnerships. Yeah. And I think that's true today as well. Mm -hmm. And like now, you know, a lot of the email we get are about, you know, counterintuitive partnerships. So maybe the bar is higher now, 
But I think like, you know, you look at what happens at universities where all these like the departments collide and it's just like when people are in the same room and have no reason to be in the same room, that's usually a good story. Thank you. Would you agree, Bryn, or is there, is, is there a different good story on climate solutions for time? Well, I think I do agree with that. I mean, and I think the strange bedfellow stories around solutions can be really, really interesting. But uh, what I would say, I think, for me, I, I don't necessarily think about telling a solution story per se. I think about, you know, as, as Eric said, a lot of my stories are more macro, looking at, you know, taking a 50,000 foot view. And I will write a story about a problem, um, and uh, you know, get into depth the depth of the problem, and then you know, maybe two thirds of the way through, say, well, here's what the solution might be, or here's what the different uh, discussions are around how we might solve this. And so I think for me, and I think for a lot of journalists, solution stories are integrated into storytelling more broadly, um, which I do think raises a bigger point, you know, with the, the press releases, and this kind of came up already, to expect a story that is about your solution is not as likely as, you know, pointing, how does that fit into the bigger picture? Yeah. So this is, uh, I'm already beginning to see some themes, which of course are going to be perfectly obvious to you because you're journalists, but probably not so much to the community that we're talking to, which is, um, uh, but, but sorry, now you, you spoke about, um, in some ways, people, unexpected uh, collaborations, communities coming together. And those, of course, are about the solutionists, about the people who are doing things, rather than necessarily about the thing, which I think is something which is often forgotten. And then also that actually, how do you put it together into an overall story and, and, and put it in? So how important is there to be a person who can represent the story? Like, it, so often in sustainability, we take the person out. You know, we talk about the technology, we talk about the stats, maybe we talk about a polar bear, but like actually putting human beings in and there being characters and interesting people, it's almost as if we sort of try to take that out sometimes of sustainability. So like, is this crucial? Do we need there to be characters and interesting people to talk to? Or does the actual just, facts or stats or there's a new report or there's a new something does that does that count well to me uh, yes well i i would say people certainly can anchor a story um i think there is at least for me and i think probably for most journalists there's a high bar right so you know the average founder of a startup working in climate tech is probably not going to meet that bar unless they've done something truly exceptional um uh, or they're incredibly you know, charismatic, or there's just got to be something that really elevates it to be a story about a person. But that is an approach. Um, you know, but characters are necessary to any story, right? So even if even if they're not, if it's not about the person, um, you need somebody. Well, you don't necessarily. I mean, there's lots of different. You know, you can do data journalism, whatever. But but it's for me, it's it's often important to have have a character. So it certainly doesn't doesn't hurt you. But um, but I wouldn't hang too much on that. Uh, oh, I thought of another email answer. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, we want them all uh, the way through. Well, like, like probably one of the worst things you could do is say, hey, um, here's this exciting thing, and it's so exciting that Zoya and Justin wrote about it. And I'm just like, <laughs> well, I don't have to do it. Right. You know, okay. like, we, we, we don't do stories that other people have written. Yeah. Uh, or at least we, that's what we tell ourselves as we write the same story that everybody else has written. <laughs> um, uh, I forget, oh, people. Oh, people. So that's interesting. And so um, I think I write about people very rarely. Um, and, uh, and as a reader is how I kind of want to answer the question, right. which is like, you know, in the 90s, journalists just like got addicted to the anecdotal lead. Like yeah. every story in any scale had to start out with, you know, yeah. as so-and-so had coffee in their kitchen or whatever. Um, and I find, and I've talked about this with other people, so it's not just me, and maybe it'll resonate more widely, is like, given the amount of things we can read at any given moment, I see an anecdotal lead, and I'm just like, I just, I got, what, what's, what, why am I here? You know, like, I scroll down to the fifth paragraph so I can just get the information to, like, why I'm here. Um, but, uh, you know, but then I sit down and lose three hours over the New Yorker, you know, so... Um, like as a writer, I, I rely almost never, I think, on anecdotal leads, but I'm, I could be an outlier. Um, I'm trying to think. I think that 
I think that characters are important in the sense that they help create some source of tension in the piece that keeps mm. people reading. Um, but that doesn't mean that those characters have to be human beings. Like um, the main characters of a piece that I'm writing right now are two dogs named Frost and Sully. So I don't, uh, I don't think it necessarily has to be people, but I do think that tension is important. I don't know if it's as crucial for shorter pieces. I agree that um, if I have to scroll past an anecdotal lead for a 600 word story, I probably won't even really scroll. I'll probably just go somewhere else for it. <laughs> but, but if it's a longer story, if it's a feature, yeah. I mean, I try and think about what readers might want and what I would want as, as a reader, which I am an avid reader of all types of journalism. Um, I love a good character. I love the tension that keeps yeah. me hooked. So this is great. What do readers want? Because I think, again, sometimes in the solutions industry, we have a want, which is, our story placed, our solutions placed, and then to be more more focused on the answers to climate change. Um, but we're thinking about what we're, I think too often we're thinking about what journalists want rather than what readers want. So we we're, we're, you know trying to get the perfect press release to a, 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 get a, a journalist's interest. Um, and going, if I tweeted this, would anybody actually retweet it? Is probably a good sign that maybe the readers aren't interested in it. So. What, what are readers interested in? Like, actually, what do people want to read? Because I think outside of journalism, most of us don't know. Eric? I think the, the question I probably ask PR people more than anything else is, what do you and your colleagues talk about when you're not talking about work that's work-related? Because like, that's what we write about. We, talk, we write about what people are talking about. And if we're not talking about your press release, we're not going to write it. But if you had lunch with uh, a colleague and you got completely wrapped up over whatever it is, you know, like a corrupt local official or a platform that doesn't work or, you know, like if you're talking about it, other people are going to want to talk about it. That's how that works. You know. I, I, would, I would say that it is, um, I mean, I don't, we're not, uh, I'm not glued to our traffic or anything, but I have a sense of what, what, what our traffic looks like. And I would say I have no idea what the reader <laughs> wants, uh, that sometimes, uh, you know, here's a solution story. I wrote about border carbon adjustment in 2019. It's a wonky solution. I was interested in it. I thought it would be a fun thing to write. It was, I believe, our second most read climate story that year. Yeah. Uh, it exploded. Why, I mean, we had a good headline, whatever, but it's very hard to predict what's going to grab people, particularly... Um, particularly on the internet. Um, it's just uh, things have a life of their own. So I guess what I boil it down to is good stories, like yeah. things that are interesting, things that you find interesting, um, you know, as you said, something you would talk about outside of work. Good story. Actually, if I... No, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was at Time Magazine uh, like before Justin was, and... Um, I, I, I know, he's been there since 1923, right? <laughs> um, no, but like... Uh, and in that Washington bureau with like, you know, those people, very high powered, very smart, you know, intimidating people. Um, I did not belong there. I'm sure they would agree. Um, is uh, there was sort of a, a heuristic that like if we found ourselves in a story in like a Tuesday meeting talking about um, a story and we just we found ourselves talking about it for 10 minutes without noticing we were talking about it, then it was probably a cover story. Yeah. We still have that role slightly different. <laughs> Five minutes, then it's a story. What's a cover? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what makes a great story? Um, man, I, I think one of the, the joys of working for a nonprofit newsroom such as grist.org is that um, I don't have to really think all that much about you know what's being read and what's not being read. Um, although I do pay attention to it. It's always nice when something gets read. But um, I think that I'd like to reframe the question a little bit. I wonder whether it might help PR folks to know that if you can show me that not just that you care about something, but that a, a community cares about it, that um, it might have some sort of impact, that that would make me look twice. I think that um, those kinds of emails would probably attract a little more attention from journalists. We, we're talking a lot about PRs and PR professionals. Let's put them aside that it's literally their job, but a huge number of the solutions that are coming are not coming from people who have got a PR agency now. They're coming from local communities, they're coming from parts of the world where perhaps um, they hadn't even thought that maybe they might be, be able to be covered in, in, in one of your 
in one of your pieces. How do you find out about stories that don't have a PR team? Because I think quite a lot of people, particularly those who are watching online, um, are perhaps working on incredible things with perhaps with great stories, great communities, great impacts, controversy, challenge, um, and it wouldn't occur to them to write a press release about it. So do you find them, uh, you know, do you Google? <laughs> like, do, do, do you listen to, do people give you tips? Like, how, how do people who don't have a PR team sort of get their story told? Or how do you find those stories? So, Oh, I'm a huge fan of the cold call. I love calling an organization and saying, hey, what are you working on? That's how I got the idea for my most recent story, which is about those two dogs, um, by calling this organization and just saying, hey, what's, what are you working on? And this guy, Pete, walked me through five or six of their projects. And at the last second, I was like, all right, thanks so much for your time. It was sort of a wash. And then he was like, wait, we've got one more thing. You might be interested in an environmental justice story. And I was like, yeah, that's the one. Um, so I'm a big fan of Colin. Um, yeah. It's always fun finding a story on your own. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. Um, but I, there's an, I don't have a formula for doing it. It's yeah. like I have felt like I've stumbled upon these gems yeah. somewhat by accident in the past, um, which is always a fun surprise. But I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a, a formula. I, I think sometimes when I see some of the, the communities that I work with or some of the, the, the folks who are working on non-tech solutions, um, they almost sort of pull the guts and glory out of it and they just want to give give the facts and their own passion and energy and obsession with these topics don't come through because they're trying to write like a PR. And so if I think one of the things which we're ha hearing now is like if these are people who constantly talk to each other about this topic, maybe that's what should come through rather than the um, you know, sort of slightly dry information that sometimes people provide. How do you find stories, Eric? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's just no, like, if you've written a story, then you're not going to write that story again in the same way. And so you're just looking for, it's like trying to find the seam in the wallpaper. It's like, oh, you know, okay, there's something there. Kind of work with that. Um, I, it's not very helpful, but it is just sort of intuitive in a way. Um, and there's things like, you know, there's the peer reviewed journals, you know, which is um, uh, science journalism is another whole topic. But um, I don't know, it's just got to be interesting. Yeah. Justin? Well, I would say there's, a, there's maybe two buckets or maybe three, but to, there's buckets that are you know, on the news, journals, um, something that's happened in the news, and I'm you know, going to sort of report and talk to people about it and, and maybe find my own angle and weigh into it. Um, and then there's the stories, I think, that are more like I heard something that has, I, I know there's something there, but I don't quite know what it is, and it leads to like a Google rabbit hole and calls and and um, whatever, one thing I do a lot of is, is read local news. So if, I'm, if I think there's something happening in a community, I will subscribe to the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I, I did a story in San Diego about uh, a road usage fee, which is uh, you know, part of their bigger, more than $100 billion transit, uh, transportation plan for the San Diego region. There were like you know a few 300 word stories in the local news. I read all of them and I was like, this is a crazy story that nobody has really done justice. Um, and then you know went out there and, and and found a whole bunch of other stories. You know, a story about air pollution on the border, which had really only been uh, there's like an advocacy group that has a terrible web. Oh, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they didn't know how to promote their own yeah. stuff, yeah. but 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 was pointing to these issues. And so it's really like for me, oftentimes pulling threads, seeing an idea, and then seeing where it leads. Um, the one thing I'll just say is just more like uh, something you can use is I certainly welcome emails from people. I mean, I welcome emails from PR people, but from people who aren't PR people, yeah. I think. Um, that definitely gets me to pay attention a little more. And, you know, frankly, it's not like all or most of those e even turn into stories, but it, it definitely, if you're taking the time to say, I read what you do, I think that this is something that you would be interested because of real reasons, yeah. I would pay attention to that. I, actually, I thought of a better answer, which is like, and, and on the topic of like formulas, I mean, I'd sort of make light of it, but like obviously, like when news happens, we have formulas, right? And it didn't occur to me five minutes ago, but like 
you know, a big report comes out or, you know, a big event happens, like here are the five things you need to know. We're going to write a story about the five things you need to know. There's probably a dozen formula stories that we do, you know, within the week of a major news event happening that we're just going to do because, like, we have to do something and, you know, we did it last time. Um, so, like, just read us and, like, that's the most obvious one is, like, the top five things, like, we're going to do that. So, like, what's one of them? So I think there's, again, for, the, for those who are watching, the getting into the local news, I think sometimes people, like, don't think that's important and that they want to go for one of you guys and get something really big, whereas actually you're watching the local news, you're looking for these stories that are coming out. So I think that's a really, really great um, angle. And then actually being able to set out these are the important things, these are the top five things that comes out, I think it's also really fantastic. Um, uh, Let's talk about sort of, and um, just you, you spoke about the solution being in the story. Uh, you know, we've all heard the line, if it bleeds, it leads. The fact that the problems, the crises, um, that's news. Like when something horrendous happens, like it's happening in Puerto Rico, but it's happening in Pakistan. These, these are news stories. And particularly with climate change, over the next couple of months and years, unfortunately, we've got those locked in. There are going to be a whole series, unfortunately, horrifically, of, if it bleeds, it leads, uh, extreme weather event stories. What we don't have locked in is sort of the solutions to that, the answers to that. Um, and so and I said I wasn't going to ask you how do we get more solutions stories in and, and can you cover them all? But how do we make sure that those of us who are trying to work on the answers uh, can kind of cut through that unrelenting but incredibly important news of the horrors and the impacts. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it can be very difficult when you're reading story after story after story of these, of these negative impacts and there aren't solutions in it. It's because, is it because the solutions we're giving you just don't feel like they stuck up against the problem? Or is it just like a yes. rule of news? Yes, okay. So, this, totally. This, the solutions don't feel like they're stuck up against the Well, I, like I mentioned in the beginning, I mean, there is one overarching climate solution. It's stop burning fossil fuels. We knew this back in 1970. Congress knew it then. It's not, that's why I get frustrated with these with these solutions that I get sometimes where I'm like, doesn't really solve any of the real problem. There's a lot of adaptation stories that are yeah. totally solution-based. Yeah. And um, I think the point you bring up is really a good one that, people get when there's there's disaster fatigue and injecting solutions in there is, is really important but I I also kind of um, I also steer clear of putting a solution in a story for the solution's sake it's not it doesn't feel totally genuine and authentic to, to the situation to do that all of the time so I don't know I, it's a really good question I wish I had a no, better no, answer if I had the answer I would be telling it <laughs> well I, I, again I think it, there's this this point of of nuance and figuring out how to communicate uh, to a journalist that this isn't the this isn't the silver bullet, yeah. um, you know. In, the, in response to a hurricane, you know, this isn't this wasn't going to stop the hurricane, but but perhaps there is something that is worth noting that adds the nuance and complexity of your story. I think that's the kind of thing that that if you know, I were working on solutions, I would be looking to do, right? Not trying to make, say, hey, look at this happy, positive thing, but actually saying, oh, your story about this really sad thing is really sad, and also, um, you know, here's this piece of that's interesting and important and nuanced, nuances your story. I find that uh, in appropriate cases, like, it's intolerable not to have a positive note or, like, some forward-looking thing. I mean, just a, one example, I do like a, a wrap up of all the latest peer reviewed science in the, in the magazine, Green Magazine, which comes out several times a year. And, um, and it's just like, it's just so overwhelming. And it's such a bummer. Like, maybe it's just me psychologically, but like the editors let me get away with it. Like the last third of it is always solutions because it's like, it's just intolerable to leave it at um, observations of what's happening. Well, actually, uh, later this week, we're doing a session on storytelling in Hollywood and about how it would be nice to have a, a climate story where we don't all fucking die at the end. Like, you know, like, you know, we, we, we could only have so many of those. 
Um, so, uh, you just mentioned editors. <laughs> I love the fact that, thank you so much for that. That sail away, sail away, that was, could not be better, uh, June, thank you. Um, uh, so, you just mentioned editors. Uh, have you ever had a story that you really wanted to write and you thought that was great, that you just couldn't? You couldn't get placed, you couldn't get agreed. Obviously, you're all fantastic at your job and every single thing you write immediately gets run and your editors are just waiting outside the door, sort of winging their hands, <laughs> waiting for the most recent piece that you're going to hand to them. But is there is there anything which um, which you've wanted to write about, particularly on solutions, but not exclusively, which just, you know, you couldn't actually get filed? Or are you allowed to say, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask that, actually. <laughs> I just... I think it's fine, but I'm, I'm going to dodge it a little bit. I, I, um, I wanted to write a story about um, an invasive insect that was uh, killing a bunch of trees in upstate New York. And I wanted to do a classic um, story where I did the problem and the, what people are kind of like trying to do to stem the problem, but mo mostly the problem, and at the end do the solution. And my editor at the time, who's now the new CEO of Grist, who's in the audience right now, said, I, she gave me this challenge, she was like, can you try doing the solution up top? Can you start off with it? Um, and that, to me, was like kind of a whole different story, but it was a really cool challenge because um, it, it broke up that formula um, and made the solution feel a little more authentic. Like, it, it, the solution led, which yeah. um, is not a saying in journalism, <laughs> but maybe it could be, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it solves it leads. Yeah, yeah. right. It doesn't quite rhyme, but <laughs> but yeah. So I think that I I don't know that I have an example of a story that was that was canned or anything, yeah. but um, I do have an ex examples of editors saying, hey, like at Grist, we try. The goal of the organization is to infuse all our coverage with solutions. It's not just solution stories. Grist does Grist writes about solutions and everything that we do. So yeah. um, I think that kind of changing our the way we think about solutions is an interesting challenge and a great thing for journalists. I think that uh, we're past the point in history where stories are getting killed because like people like us are too early. Uh, there were a lot of years where uh, different places it was hard to um, write these stories because you know we're dealing with primary sources and um, so we saw first what's happening. Uh, I guess I, one part of this maybe is there's a tweet, of course, um, th that came around and I wish I knew what it was because I think about it all the time. And it was, um, it was uh, a view of a writer at the beginning of the career versus a view of a veteran writer. And the writer at the beginning of the career, it was a gif of like, my words, you're, you're hurting my words, you're killing my babies. Yeah. Um, and then the, the, the veteran writer, it was just, you fix it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there, there is that element of, um, you know, it starts to be an assembly line and there's things you care about and things you don't care about and you win some and you lose some and most of the time the editors are right. Um, you listening? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't, I mean, yes, obviously there are lots of stories that I pitched that didn't, that did not, um, get uh, taken. Um, I do think, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I can think about a lot of those and say, well, probably not the worst call. Um, but um, I guess I don't really have a great answer. It's the long and short of it. No, it's, it, it's so interesting for us because, of course, you're the climate bait. You know how this works. You've been doing it for a long time. For the rest of us, it's almost like sort of this mysterious process of, what happens? What gets? What gets? What gets chosen by the journalist? Sort of, you know. Where, where, and, and of course, for many of us, it sort of almost feels like it's like I pick you, I pick you. So it's so so interesting mm -hmm. to hear about why. Um, because, so I got a call yesterday yeah. from a guy I know who works on um, clean energy grid stuff, yeah. um, and he said, "Oh, the article was so great. You know, it was. I mean, whatever. It was a dinky article." Um, uh, and, um, but like, how long do you work on it? And it was, I just like, I got an email Friday morning from my editor saying, you have the Monday newsletter, where is it? And I was like, I wrote up the last conversation I had and we just went with it and I finished something else at the end of the day. So it's like, the amount of chaos is yeah. unbelievable. 
and the, and, the, and the sort of luck of timing, right? I mean, if you try to pitch, if you tried to pitch something or to, you know, to have a conversation about a story when the Inflation Reduction Act dropped, good luck. Like that month was gone. Um, luck. I've just come from the UK where obviously last week there was no news at all for a week. So yeah, the, the issue of, of context mm -hmm. being, being quite key. So we're coming towards the um, the end of our time. And uh, I think this, this session and this conversation has probably given a lot of people a lot of hope about the fact that actually if they thought more about a story, if they thought more about what they were uh, passionate about and where the actual interest and excitement is rather than the information and perhaps those who don't and can't afford a PR agency means that you you are still allowed to talk to a journalist even if you're not a, even if you're not a PR and you're allowed you're allowed to put it um, uh, let's talk briefly about Twitter um, and about Twitter as a news source um, as a sort of, as a source of hell as a source of like um, uh, so, so much of the public discourse now seems to be happening in public um, you know, are you on Twitter? Do you find it really difficult in terms of how people are responding to your stories? Like, how, how has that changed life for a journalist, particularly on the climate beat? Because we know the topics that we care about and talk about, there are a lot of, how should I say this pol politely, extremely vocal, all upper caps held views on our topic. So like, how, how, do you, how do you negotiate that? Because a lot of people will be reading you, but a lot of people will be following you as well on Twitter. So how's that changed? Like, has it changed journalism? So that's quite a big question. Has Twitter changed journalism? Yeah, I, this panel is actually the longest I haven't been on Twitter in, in 10 years. Um, <laughs> You don't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something really massive would have happened right now. Yeah. I'll. Yeah, no. You know, it's um, Twitter is obviously uh, destroying democracies and the fabric of society, uh, but if with a, just a little bit of time, yeah. um, it's just the most remarkable tool for like micro professional communities that's yeah. ever been. Uh, it's just like everything, like all the researchers, you know, there's so much um, that you learn about that you wouldn't otherwise learn about. Um, it's useful uh, for getting in touch with people. You know, Twitter is like what you, the, the, the service that the front page of newspapers used to uh, provide is now um, Twitter in some ways, uh, I don't want to over, like I don't rely on it all that for everything, but, um, but instead of having like, you know, a dozen guys sitting in a room deciding what's gonna be on the front page, yeah. your front page is assembled by, you know, however many thousand people, um, you know, who you've asked to do it for you. So it's- A thousand white guys in a room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, and so, one of the things which really interests me about people who work in this field, um, and for journalists, this must be in some ways even more intense, is we work every day dealing with, uh, I think somebody called it the sort of apocalypse beat, the really, really, really difficult stuff. Um, and as journalists, you know, you're not just got one area of focus, which most of us have. You have to look at the entirety of the climate um, uh, piece. And yet you're still in there. You're still telling those stories. You're still making it happen. Um, how do you cope? How do you keep your energy up, your desire to keep writing about this? Because we're human beings as well, and we get scared and overwhelmed and worried. Um, I, I, do, at the end of the day, do you just put this down? Um, how, how do you keep your essential hope and desire to keep writing about this, even though so much of what you have to write about is so difficult? So. Uh, I think, um, I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it feels like a, a purposeful career to do that, right? It feels like there's something that is um, hopefully, um, you know, adding something positive to society uh, in doing uh, uh, my job. So, you know, I think that's what keeps me going to do it. I think. Um, you know, I find, I find that I often, like I've learned that I need to take a, a time at night where I don't look at Twitter and I read a book and I, you know, sort of try to, a book that is not about climate okay. and not about politics yeah. and is about something completely yeah. different. Uh, so just finding times to check out um, from it is what I'd say. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Uh, the uh, sometimes gallows humor, uh, yeah. sometimes weeping, uh, yeah. a lot of meditation. 
Yeah. Uh, that helps a lot of people, I think. And um, you know, there's there's a bunch of different answers. I mean, one of them, and like the nerdiest answer I could think of, is um, is that like I've been doing this for a long time, and I noticed after a couple of years that like, and I wrote a book about this ultimately, um, that once you start, once you ask the stupidest possible question, which is, what is carbon? Yeah. Um, you know, then it, it's not just carbon dioxide, it's like you start, well, it's 80% of the structure of DNA, yeah. and like, just from carbon dioxide, asking the stupidest possible question about what that is, you get transported on the entire conveyor of life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, wow. the ancient atmospheres, you know, the layers that we can tell in the rock, you know, like why the fossil fuel is there, where it's going to go next, like, you know, how we got to have fingers. Like, there's no limit to um, how many disciplines of knowledge you can organize by just looking through carbon dioxide. Yeah. And, like, there's a lot of reasons I pay attention to this, but, like, probably certainly the nerdiest one is like, it just helps everything make sense. Yeah, brilliant. Wow, that was like, yeah. like a, a philosophical level. <laughs> you and I are gonna talk entropy at some point. <laughs> second law of thermodynamics said um, carbon. Um, sorry. Yeah, I just need a second to stop reeling from that. Yeah. Um, I, let's see, I don't know. I think that the, like the human capacity for protecting itself from bad news is pretty astounding. I don't. I put this stuff down at the end of the day and I don't think about it again, to be honest. But um, then I'll like cry when I see roadkill randomly. Yeah. So it like comes out in other ways. But I was, um, I was in Montana on the Blackfeet Reservation on Sunday. And I was talking to this woman who is working to protect her tribe from a number of threats. Um, and I won't get into them now. You'll have to read the article. But um, she, her, her capacity for hope was enormous. And it kind of knocked me off my feet. And I think that for me, reporting, being in the field, seeing people, communities, those characters, um, dogs occasionally up close, is the way that I keep going because it's just, it's so exciting and people are incredibly hopeful despite the odds and that makes me m more hopeful. So that's a beautiful way to end. Thank you so very much. I want to take this opportunity on behalf of everybody who pitches you and most of <laughs> you don't cover them and sends you the awful press releases, but all of us are immensely grateful that there is a carbon beat. We are so, so, so pleased that we have journalists such as you being able to keep this, turn, find the stories, keep it going, keep it talked about. Like I started my journey in this in, in, in the late 90s and I have seen the impact that your journalism has had in terms of the public profile and the conversation about climate change. So um, I just wanted to close. Oh, I, I was just gonna say thank you. Yeah. Um, and in my thanks, obviously, if there is, uh, uh, my thanks include gratitude and platforming. So what <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I just wanted to share like one of my favorite like episodes with a press uh, uh, a, a communications person ever, what happened last year, and um, and you know we we're I don't know how close uh, everyone is to like climate nerd um, you know but there are s what are called scopes scope one scope two scope three and it's a way of accounting for emissions and like our just our whole lives from dawn to dusk is with scopes for that period of months. And I like was on a call with colleagues and I said, let's just write about scope X. And scope X is all of the emissions that you can't count because it's from you know, the big PR companies and the law firms and the accounting agencies. Um, and everybody's like, oh my God, you have to write scope X. You do it for a column. And then like months went by and I wrote it. Um, and then I did the worst thing you could possibly do, which is like Google your cool idea and like she had already written it. And so I had to go back and I rewrote it from scratch because it was no longer about our cool idea. It was about her cool idea. Um, and what the lesson there that I think is real is like earnestness and thought leadership um, are, are real things that are accessible to everyone. 
and you can go out on the internet and be better than us, which is not a very high bar. Um, but like that, that was like, that's the best. You didn't ask like, what's the best one? What's the best example? But that's the answer to the best example. Uh, thank you so very much. I really appreciate that. And I promise I will keep writing things solely to annoy you. So, um, uh, I, uh, Justin, Eric, sorry, Sam, thank you so much. I think you will probably find that these were simple, obvious things to you about how this world works and were incredibly valuable and useful to those people who are working so hard to actually make these solutions and really want to tell a story about it. Um, and I think you've just made the world a little bit more interesting in the world of solutions. Thank you so very much. Please join me in thanking <laughs> Justin and Eric.